So we've had a couple questions around resourcing and kind of team structure. Bill asked, um, you can state that product ops should be a consideration for any company regardless of size. How have you seen a pattern to when companies start creating the product ops discipline? And then I'm also going to throw in there one from Arthur around um, what are some ways to determine when capacity headcount, for example, needs to increase? So like, is there a trigger of when to start? And then at what point do you expand and grow? I'm going to let someone else go first this time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one thing I would just say here is I, I think this is related to the concept of just when we talk about resourcing, right? Like it's usually where are our bets going to be that we think is most valuable for us to focus on. So um, I think product ops is always going to be, I think, understaffed based on the duty that it has to perform in some way. Um, but it also makes us, I think, in some way scrappier or will help us focus on kind of smaller interventions that are more likely to be longer term gains. And so um, I think as a product ops person, you're going to be overloaded with way too many things. And so being very strict about how you prioritize is very important. Um, I, I found it really hard to actually delegate um, things as a product ops person, because I think for me as well, I like, especially when it comes to enablement or opinions about like certain types of training, um, I think we need, I, I need to do personally a better job of delegating some of that stuff um, personally. So I think maybe that's more like my own issue, right? When it comes to the way I want these types of things to work. But I think it is, it is really, really valuable that if you embrace this idea of an experimentation mindset, adding more people that are willing to experiment in more cases is probably very valuable. The problem is, is that like, when does churn from an experimentation standpoint become overburdensome for your product organization? And so I think that's that's like the counterbalance that we need to pull into this is that I think product ops is, should be incredibly experiment driven. But I think if you do too many of these things, people will feel like their organization is constantly changing out from underneath them. Um, so I think it's like, yeah, it's, it's a really tough one. I, I, I definitely would love to hear what the other what, what everybody else thinks too, but that that's what the part that I've been struggling with is like it's okay to be overloaded because we just need to prioritize. I think is is the way that I think about it. Yeah, I think uh, I think it definitely there are uh, there's part of the job is it's uh, very people and high touch, and then part of the job can totally be uh, automated. And sometimes I I've seen part of people just become a very administrative and and making numbers and putting spreadsheets and putting slide decks and those are not great. I have a couple of examples of you know sort of the the resources that people know when uh, you know that one of the company at work uh, I was you know help them building the first product organization before I joined there was no product manager just engineers and and uh, yeah professional services project managers. And, and when we started building product uh, organization, we started to have like, when you have a four or five, six product managers, then, you know, we're almost 80, 20 rules, 20% 20 of the time starting to do things that can really be centralized to, to be something more efficient and, and automated or centralized and so on. So at about 5 p.m. level, we start introduce the first product operations person so that person can help to run uh, various cadences, interact with the different the teams so that we make sure the whole product organization run as, as internally well and across functionally well. But the funny thing is that we didn't proportionally linearly increase from 10 people to have two product ops. But the whole role about ops is the whole about the efficiency, right? So, and you can see when the product organization get bigger, your product ops to product manager ratio has to go smaller. It's not like every five people because that make that role is definitely not efficiently run. And, and that's really, uh, some of them is to prioritize what you can do. And some of them is to find the right owner. For example, if you say, hey, you know, product manager onboarding and training coaching that should go to, by the time you have a 20 product managers, you probably have an HR organization and a learning organization or some other partners to really outsource most of them and for you to so understanding where we are in terms of training, where, where, are, where the PMs, the feelings about that, and then you can and then drive programs being led by someone else. So it's very interesting to see there's a somewhat of an interesting ratio, even at PayPal, we, it's a bigger organization. I want to use PayPal because it's a bigger organization. I have a lot more data points to say over the years, what we're seeing is that the ratio of PMs to product ops, it's, it just gets bigger, uh, more PMs and less number of product ops. In the end, we have like three, 400 PMs and then we have like five product ops, right? And because there are a lot of other functions take on the roles, then that's more better suited for that function. And, and that's, that's a force, force modifiers product, product ops, right? 
So I, I think that's something I would I would say is like if your product manager is spending you know more than twenty percent of their time to do things that kind of consistent from team to team, this time product ops have to come in to see is it something can be standardized, can be systematized, it can be can be taken away. If product ops do the same thing, right? If you turn more than 20% of the time of multiple product ops doing the same, then you say, okay, so we should find a system or tooling or another party that better to standardize that part and componentize that business and service API to somewhere else. Maybe one thing I would just add here too is like, I, I do think that having the product community or community of practice do some of the standardization is also very val valuable. So like, when we talk about this, we've been experimenting with this idea of like a playbook, which allows for topic mobbing with regards to PM. So like, I need help with road mapping. Who is interested in talking about road mapping? Right. right? Like, I think if it, the product ops people are always the ones that are just answering that question, that's not a community, right? Like that's right. that's like a power, that's a power structure. So I don't know. I, I think that's the part that I also struggle with is like, it should actually be the community that's also building things for the community. But where's that line, I guess, is, is a tough thing that we haven't figured out yet. Um, yeah, in, in, in my case, when we were at Farfetch, we found that the problem was, and, and that's when the org starts getting really big, is that you, so, you know, you can, you, you have some that are working at the level of leadership, right, of the product leadership, and then you have others that need to be at a product uh, manager level, and you can't be across both, right, because you're constantly jumping between, oh, this is tactical, and this is high level, and it gets very confusing, so that's when the team, we felt the team needed to grow. Um, but for example, the out systems team um, is a great example. What they did was they wanted to create a, a training program for the PMs, right? And they wanted to create this whole program to uh, build up the capabilities of the, the product management team. And what they did was they hired a person who their focus is that, right? And so that's the thing. It's sometimes it's around um, identifying people for key moments or key things that need to be structured in there. Um, but, you know, again, and, and like you're saying, Becky, I agree. We do, our ratio tends to, um, you know, start widening as we go. But I think it, it's also normal because ideally if we're doing our product work properly, um, right. you know, we should have less interventions, right? Exactly. So the underlying infrastructure should be there. The right. baseline should be there. We should right. actually make ourselves redundant, right. which exactly. I like to say, you know, we're, we're working yeah, to is. make ourselves redundant to, to a point, um, right. you know, so, but uh, you know, I, it, it's not an easy option because it depends on the team. It depends on the company. Right. Like for example, sometimes you're going to a company and design ops isn't needed because the design team does their ops really, really well but the product team is terrible at it, then you know you need product ops, right? And vice versa. It'll all depend. There are teams that are doing it really, really well and they can squeeze it into the middle work. And then you'll find that other teams who are just losing control and, and they need someone to help them take control of things a bit. Um, yeah, so it, it, you know, it, it does take it. You have to choose. You just have to choose which is the best option, I guess. Right. One of the things I want to add on to it is like, you know, we should also look at analogies. And the thing that I found out the most similar is the sales ops. If you look at sales ops and the product ops, in many ways, very, very similar. Uh, how, you know, the ratios, the focus, and it's really evolving depending on the competencies, the system tooling in place and, and, and you know, the needs, um, you know, of, of the organization. So it's always good to find similarity in a different realm and, and, and apply to our current practice, right? 